I'm Eric Coffson, Technical Marketing Engineer for Cisco Systems. I will present on the clustering enhancements provided by the Cisco Secure Firewall 7.3 release. Clustering is a key capability of the Cisco Secure Firewall. It allows combining multiple Cisco Secure Firewalls into a single logical device. This allows you to pay as you grow, adding nodes as your traffic needs increase, up to 16 nodes depending upon the platform. It does offer resilience for certain load balancing solutions. For physical devices, you typically use ether channel, and that will certainly provide the resilience at the connection level because of replication of the connection state within the cluster. For virtual devices, it's trickier because you need layer three load balancers, and that will vary from load balancer to load balancer and public cloud provider to public cloud provider. Originally, this was introduced for the ASA firewall and extended to the Cisco Secure Firewall Threat Defense and more recently to the virtual platforms. With each release, we enhance clustering, and here is a collection of enhancements that I will be discussing today. First is Azure Cluster Support. We've extended clustering for the Cisco Secure Firewall to Azure up to 16 nodes. This is very similar to our AWS clustering introduced in 7.2. The cluster control link uses a VXLAN over UDP to communicate. It supports both the network and gateway load balancers native to Azure, supports snapshots. You have to use custom data to bootstrap the cluster. You could not configure the cluster after you've deployed the firewalls. After the cluster is formed, you register one node to the FMC and all the other nodes are auto-discovered and auto-registered. Here's an example of the custom data. That's very simple to create a cluster. A little more complicated though, if you want that cluster to integrate with the gateway load balancer. And there's a real challenge here if you're going to put this into an ARM template because you would want to combine parameters to build this custom data. For example, here's what our network load balancer version of the cluster template looks like in GitHub. Here, it is even more complicated for integration with the gateway load balancer. One thing you could do is build the custom data external to the ARM template and use the base64 encoded string as a parameter. But one way or the other, you may find yourself troubleshooting custom data. One of the challenges being the custom data includes the admin password. So if the custom data is corrupted, it won't be deployed and you won't be able to log in as admin. However, in Azure, the FTD always has a separate Linux login. You will see this when you deploy an ARM template. And this login is not connected to the custom data. Therefore, you can log in as that user with that password that you configured, and you can view the custom data. There, we show you the path to the file. Once you find your error, you could theoretically uh, fix your ARM template and redeploy. Here we have logged into two clusters, the one on the left for the network load balancer, the one on the right for the gateway load balancer, and the commands where they're running are going to have identical output before and after registration with the FTD. We start with show cluster info, everything looks nice. Let's look at the default interface configuration. Notice that the uh, third data interface is not configured in the case of the gateway load balancer. The third data interface is the cluster control link for network load balancer, but the second is the cluster control link for the gateway load balancer. Both have to have an NVE for encapsulating the traffic for communication on the cluster link, but for the gateway load balancer, we need a second NVE to encapsulate the traffic to communicate with the gateway load balancer. Notice the NVE has a source interface, which is actually an object group. That object group has a single object in it. And that object represents the range of addresses on the cluster controlling. As far as the VNI, we have a VNI for communication with the cluster controlling, but in the case of the gateway load balancer, we also have a VNI for communication with the gateway load balancer, and that has the internal and external UDP ports and VXLAN segment IDs. 
Here's what this looks like in the UI. Let's start with the cluster that is associated with the network load balancer. Now let's look at the VTAP and what we will see is that we have a simple configuration of the NVE for the cluster control communication. If we go to the interfaces tab, we have a single read-only interface for the uh, VNI, and this is used for the cluster communication. Notice that there is no internal or external port or segment ID for this VNI. Now let's go to the other cluster. And we'll see for this other cluster, we actually have two NVEs, one identical with what we had before, again, read only, and this is for the cluster communication, and the other for communication with the gateway load balancer that includes the IP address of the gateway load balancer front end. We have two read-only VNIs, one identical to what we saw in the previous cluster. This is for the cluster communication. No internal or external UDP ports or segment IDs, and one for communication with the gateway load balancer that has more complex configuration because of those UDP ports and segment IDs. Let's talk about AWS target failover. So this involves what you do with existing flows through a layer three load balancer. You can start with Azure. At this point in Azure, either the gateway and network load balancer do not perform target failover. So if a target becomes unhealthy, the existing flows are continued to be forwarded to that target. They will not fail over to a healthy target. Google Cloud for a while has allowed you to configure target failover. They called it connection persistence. You set it to never persist, meaning don't persist in sending traffic to the unhealthy host. And therefore, when we introduced clustering on Google Cloud in 7.2, we provided connection level resilience. AWS introduced target failover in October of 2022 and only for its gateway load balancer. Therefore, our 7.2 product, which have been released, started to provide connection level resilience. And how do you configure this? Well, in the AWS console, it's very simple. You have to use the new experience version of the console. You drill down to the target group and to its attributes, and then it's very easy to see that you could enable target failover, but it's disabled by default. We didn't have to make any code changes to the FMC or FTD because this was already supported in 7.2. Now, technically, we did do something in 7.3. We extended clustering in AWS to our ASA version of the Cisco Secure Firewall. But since it's the same clustering technology, it automatically supported the AWS target failover. There is a challenge though with your automation because your CloudFormation templates and any Python scripts you wrote will probably not enable these attributes. They're disabled by default. And a matter of fact, if you drill down into this, you'll see that there are two attributes one for how you deal with unhealthy hosts and one for how you deal with hosts that are deregistered from the load balancer. You probably want to enable both of those in your automation. Moving on to cluster health monitoring. With each release, we've been enhancing our health monitoring and 7.3 was our opportunity to enhance health monitoring for clustering. We actually have a dashboard with four tabs on it as seen here. And this gives you a lot of information about performance, also, in the case of certain models, we'll give you information about the power supply. For your reference, here are the performance metrics that we gather for cluster health monitoring. And here's uh, what the overview looks like. There's also a load distribution, performance, and cluster control link tab. And you can create your own custom tabs. As far as the cluster health check is concerned, we've simplified the usability. Before 7.3, you had to use FlexConfig. FlexConfig was a way to compose chunks of CLI commands for the data plane and deploy them to the data plane. But now in 7.3, you can deploy this through the UI in a very intuitive manner. Here, we show you the screens involved in performing the health check in the FMC. As far as cluster backup, a minor sounding but very convenient improvement, we now can back up the entire cluster at once, rather than backing up each node individually. 
If a couple of the data nodes fail, it's not a problem. It'll just skip those data nodes. If the control node backup fails, the whole thing fails and you have to try again. Here's what it looks like in the UI. Very simply, you see the cluster when you go to perform the backup. And all this really is, is we took the tar files for all of the backups of the nodes and tarred them together into a tar file of tar files and put that in var sf remote backups. As far as restoring, this is essentially identical to what you had before. You extract the appropriate tar file for the node that you want to restore and you restore it as you did before the 7.3 release. I do want to point out that on the 4100 and 9300, there's also an FXOS configuration, which is not part of this backup and that has to be backed up and restored separately. And with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you very much for your time.